Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Denise Demese. I'm Director of Faculty Development with the University System of Georgia. And we welcome you to um, this webinar about building a certified peer observation program, improving teaching and removing biases. And we have four presenters here with us today from the University of North Georgia, Rebecca Johnston, Roger Runquist, Carl Olrenberg, and Lindsay Linsky. So uh, welcome everyone. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Becky. Thank you so much, Denise. Everybody this morning, before we begin, we would like to take just a moment to have you complete a poll. You should on your screen see a graphic with a multitude of different facial expressions. I think Lindsay is gonna put the link to the poll into the chat so that everybody can access it. But if you take just a moment and respond to the statement, your class is gonna be formally observed today. Which one of these reflects your reaction? I'm going to copy and paste it. It should be already in there. We can do it one more time. So Lindsay, are you going to be able to show the results of the poll? Yes, I believe for, uh, Roger, I believe was going to, since it, but he's the one sharing the screen. There we go, so that we can see. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so they're still coming in, responses are still coming in. Wow, we have more five than I anticipated. I think the number of, <laughs> <laughs> individuals who selected Tony Collette <laughs> is very interesting. I, I definitely like number three as well. <laughs> Lots of number nine with Denzel yeah. Washington. He's making a great <laughs> expression. But there's a high number of people looking like the genie. That seems positive. Yeah. Come on in. <laughs> it's like his face is saying. <laughs> okay. Eight. That's kind of a happy expression. Surprise, but happy. There have definitely been points in my career where number seven would have been the response. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's that true. Right? That's true. Yeah, this had... Had we asked this of your in your first year, it probably yeah. a different a different number you may have picked a different number. So which one has not gotten any responses? Six. Jack Nicholson. Six. Jack Nicholson and a few good men. I suppose that's good. Yes, that's a positive thing. And no uh, crying. Well, I don't know number. if that's if if that's where he's yelling. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> I would have to say some days. <laughs> that is what that moment is. Yeah. Yep. It depends on the day. That's that's correct. Yeah. No one chose Squidward. If you, if you don't if you don't teach statistics and you're coming into my statistics class, <laughs> that might be my response. <laughs> All right, Lindsay. Um, do you think yeah. we should move on? Yeah, well, as you can see, the, um, the, the thought of having somebody come in to observe you definitely solicits a number of different emotions and, and reactions, and that might change from day to day. And so, yes, Becky's going to um, now speak a little bit about, uh, about how we maybe got to this point and where we're going, how we're going to move forward. So thank you, Denise, for introducing each of us. We are the leadership team of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Leadership at the University of North Georgia. And the purpose of the presentation today is to really take a critical look at student evaluations of teaching as reflected by the extant literature. We're going to reduce that to sets from this point forward. Um, so if I say sets, I'm referring to student evaluations. We're going to discuss the benefits of peer observation versus student evaluations of teaching. 
We'll explain sort of the genesis of our program here, how it began, why it began, where we are in that process. We will talk about elements of our program and we will provide opportunity for questions and discussion at the end. So if you could take just a moment and list something either strange or unusual or unique or crazy that you have seen or heard of on any student evaluation. It could be something really positive. It could be something very negative, just the most unusual, odd thing you have heard on a student evaluation. So on this Padlet, if you're not familiar with this platform, when you click the link in the chat, there um, will be a little pink plus sign in the bottom right hand corner. And you can just click that and, and type in your response. It does not have to be something from your evaluations. It could be um, from any that you have seen or heard of. We're expecting some interesting ones. <laughs> <laughs> they jump around, they're, they're populating fast, so it's a little bit difficult to read. She's them. like my evil stepmother. Oh, wow. <laughs> she is the devil. Underwear line showing through pants. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Uh wardrobe my first year teaching is a good read oh my goodness the one about the surgery <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> this is a keeper i tell you what oh, yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is a keeper. did somebody say think of her like my own body Needs to wear clothing that shows less leg. Wow, there's lots of clothing commentary. Talk too much about marketing when it was a marketing class. <laughs> Students' worst nightmare. Goodness gracious. You notice the clothes comments are all about women. We're going to get into that. We, yeah. we shall get into that. Mm -hmm. Spent too much time complimenting clothing. Boring lectures, I could teach this myself. Professor takes too many drinks of water. <laughs> Worst calculus professor ever, <laughs> but this person teaches biology. So if nothing these, else, this could be a therapeutic exercise <laughs> for all of us. These are um, very, very interesting. Yeah. And actually, they, they prove some, provide some good examples for some of the things we're going to talk about. Yes. All right, Lindsay, do you think we should move on? Yes, as, as you can clearly see. Um, so, you know, what's interesting to me is that very few of these actually have to do with the instruction itself and and what actually was said and done in the classroom it's all these extra extra things that do not have implications on the classroom many of them and so so that make, that brings us to um the one of the biggest issues with sets uh, which becky is going to describe so I'm going to start by speaking about some of the inherent issues that have been documented in the literature with student evaluations of teaching with sets. We will move on to studies that seem at first glance to present them positively and look at some of the issues at hand there. But as background, sets across the United States today are the primary source of data utilized by most institutions to evaluate teaching, make decisions about merit raises, and promotion and or tenure decisions. So they are typically at most institutions weighted fairly heavily in making very critical career decisions about faculty and teaching staff. However, the use of sets as the primary form of a high stakes measure is extraordinarily problematic. Issues include invalidity, unreliability, 
bias and small sample size. And so I just want to take a quick moment. We'll, we'll talk about the statistics part of it in more detail a little bit later, but a quick moment to discuss those words to make sure we're all on the same page as we sort of go through and talk about these things. So in statistics, invalidity or validity refers to whether or not the instrument, and by the instrument, I mean test, right? The evaluation form, whether or not the instrument actually measures what it purports to measure or what is it, it is intended to measure. So a quick example would be if I wanted to evaluate um, a student's ability to read out loud very well, but I administered a written test. A written test where a student is responding and writing does not in any way evaluate whether or not that student can read out loud or read, right? So that would be an invalid measure of what it is we're trying to measure. So that's validity. Reliability implies that if you were to administer that instrument again to another sample, to many samples over time, you would get the same or similar results. When there are issues with unreliability, it suggests that, that there are too many variables, uncontrolled variables, impacting the results or there's a flaw in the instrument itself. So that's reliability. Bias, there are lots of different types of biases, but when speaking about student evaluations of teaching, what we're really talking about is bias on the part of the evaluator, the individual biases that the student brings to the evaluation process, and then small sample sizes are problematic. So here's a very extreme example for you. Suppose that half of a class, a small sample size, half of a small sample size responds, and all those responders on a scale of one to five evaluate the teaching effectiveness as a two, but only half of that class responded. The reason that's problematic is because if all the, if the rest of the people who did not respond rated teaching effectiveness as a one, that score, that overall score could be as low as a 1.5. But if the other half of the class who did not respond rated that teaching effectiveness as say a seven, it could be as high as 4.5. So small sample sizes and low numbers of responders in that sample size are incredibly problematic. And we see a lot of that in student evaluations of teaching. Next slide. So another major problem with student evaluations of teaching is that they do not legitimately assess teaching effectiveness. This comes to the validity of the instrument. The instrument purports to measure teaching effectiveness, but student evaluations are not objective measures of teaching effectiveness. They are measures of student opinions of teaching effectiveness or student opinions about their experiences in a particular class. This is problematic because students aren't qualified to assess teaching effectiveness. They have not been trained to do that. They've not been trained in what the elements of teaching effectiveness in an objective sense actually are. SETS or student evaluations of teaching gather the collective views of students and their student experience in a single course with a particular faculty member. And because of this, it's not a global evaluation. It's an evaluation of a student's perception of one point in time in one course. Further problems with sets that have been identified in the literature include the fact that there are many, many behaviors and skills, and this is not at all an exhaustive list, associated with teaching effectiveness like knowledge and content expertise, the teaching methodology used, course design and organization, the quality of course materials used, the assessment instruments themselves and the methods used to assess, grading practices. Students, because they've not been trained in these things, are not qualified to comment upon things like course design or the quality of course materials. They can give their opinions of those things, but they have not been trained to objectively evaluate those things. Some further problems with sets are that the literature has, fit, much literature has documented the fact that female instructors tend to be evaluated more critically than male instructors, even when all other variables are equivalent. For example, gender bias accounts for about 0.5 on a five point scale. And if you think about that, if you think about a five point scale, 0.5 is fairly significant on that scale. 
Female instructors tend to be evaluated more critically, even in situations in which the gender is randomly assigned. And this bias influences even completely objective measures like the time it takes to return work. And what this means is if you have two instructors, one's male, one's female, and they both take one week to get essay tests back to students, the female instructors uh, on the metric for returning work will receive on average about a 0.5 lower evaluation than the male, simply because the teacher is female when all of the other variables were equivalent. Some other documented biases that emerge in the literature are faculty rank, student motivation, if the course is either required for the program or an elective, the anticipated grade, that one's enormous, upper division versus lower division courses, class size itself, the particular academic discipline, and the particular workload that the student carries that semester. So here's an example. If you have a junior faculty member and a senior faculty member teaching the exact same course, the senior faculty member tends to be rated more highly. If you have um, a student who believes that their anticipated grade is low, their evaluations of the instruction tend to be lower and vice versa. Um, if a student has a very high workload, they are more likely to rate all teaching experiences that they have that semester lower uh, than they might have in a semester when the workload was not as high. So these are all examples of things that tend to influence student responses that are not immediately tied to some sort of objective measure. So another primary problem with the SETS data itself and the way that it tends to be utilized in institutions of higher education is that valid evaluations or analyses of this data cannot be made using parametric statistics. The data is categorical and it's ordinal. Categorical means we are ascribing it into one category or another and ordinal is that there is a natural order like one, two, three, four. And most um, teaching evaluation systems use a Likert type scale. So parametric analyses make assumption of symmetry in the distribution that is not reflected in the data. And that is problematic. So here's an example. The ratings fall in categories that have a natural order from usually one to five, some institutions use one to seven, but these numbers are labels and they don't have quantities. We could replace the numbers on those scales with words like not at all effective, slightly effective, and extremely effective without losing any of the meaning. So does it make sense to take the average of slightly effective and very effective and rely on average evaluation scores equating the effectiveness of an instructor who gets two ratings, for example, of five, and treat that the same as an instructor who gets a three and a seven because they both average to five? Would that mean that they were really equivalent? It's problematic because scatter, the scatter of the distribution matters. For instance, suppose that the department average for a particular course is 4.5, and the average for a particular instructor in a particular semester is 4.2 that instructor's rating is below the average. But how bad is that? And what is the meaning of that? There's no way to tell from averages alone because instructor to instructor and semester to semester variability is great. If all other instructors get an average of exactly 4.5 when they teach the course, 4.2 might be atypically low. On the other hand, if instructors sometimes get sixes half the time and sometimes get threes half the time, 4.2 is well within an, an acceptable spread of that data. So instead of reporting averages, what we should really be doing is reporting the distribution of scores, which can be done using a bar graph, but that's not how the data is typically used. Other problems with sets that have been documented are that it's possible to have instructors who are extremely effective at teaching, but receive very low value scores on sets because of various variables. And the reverse is also true. It's possible to have instructors who utilizing objective measures probably are not the most effective teachers, but because they have other variables present or because of the biases of the student evaluators receive very high teaching scores from students. Um, continuing on with this discussion, the use of sets for making hiring decisions 
promotion and merit increase decisions can encourage poor teaching, i.e. if a faculty member knows that they're going up for um, a merit raise and they want to ensure that they receive all positive student evaluation scores, they might not grade as harshly in order to try to achieve higher scores. It can result in grade inflation and that can empower students to shape faculty behavior through the student evaluation process versus what we would hope, which is faculty always striving through the best objective measures possible to provide the most rigorous and excellent teaching possible. Higher education, despite all of these things, continues to use sets data regardless of the problems that have been documented. One right slide. Already, already advanced. There are studies that certainly at face value speak to um, positive things about the use of student evaluations of teaching. They're positively correlated with teaching effectiveness and student learning when they are used in aggregate, i.e. when you are looking at multiple evaluations over long periods of time and looking at the data and what is yielded altogether. They can be useful for comparing multiple individuals across departments of programs, again, when looking at much data that is occurring over time, but they don't distinguish among individual teachers, especially through a single class. And in, in one set of data and one faculty annual review, what you get is a single point in time with one class, a single point in time with another class. When that data is most useful is when you're looking at all the data in one semester, multiple semesters over time. Those things yield trends and valuable data that can be used to indicate that there may be issues or things that could improve. Other studies in support suggest that scores from multiple courses taught over multiple years may give indication of individual teacher effectiveness, as I mentioned, particularly when we're looking at data over time and at trends that may emerge in the data. So brief history of student evaluations of teaching. In the 1970s, they've been around since about the 1920s, but in the 1970s, they were used primarily for formative assessment i.e. how can this teaching be improved? And when we speak about formative assessment versus summative assessment, formative assessment are points in time that are used to help an individual create change from point to point. They are used to um, assist in or indicate growth. A summative evaluation is a single summation, a single um, summation of the effectiveness of someone at one point in time, and they tend to be very high stakes measures. Since the 1970s, we've moved from student evaluations as a formative process closer to student evaluations as a high stakes summation. They are used often as absolute measures of the quality of teaching. So here are some recommendations. Sets are a poor indicator of an individual instructor's overall effectiveness. They should be used formatively. They are valuable in a formative sense. The rating should be evaluated from multiple courses across time. If participation rate is poor, those evaluation scores should not be used. And we gave that example a moment ago. I'll give you a real life example. I had a class one time in which there were only four students. It was an upper, upper level um, capstone seminar experience and there were only four of them. Um, that particular year, only two of them responded and those particular two did not like me as a human being. That data did not yield anything useful. For one thing, I had a 50% participation rate. That's too low. There were only four people. The sample size is too low to gather any meaningful data from. And um, there was poor participation and there were many, many variables at play in that situation. So data re resulting from sets should be looked at critically in light of all of those things. Additionally, it should be used alongside other forms of evaluation to help inform other forms of objective evaluation. After discussing all of this, many of you are probably thinking, why are they still the primary means of evaluation used, given all of the issues that have been documented? Well, for one thing, it's very easily quantifiable data. It is easy to repeat the assessment. We have this instrument, we send it out, we get the data, we analyze it, and we do it every semester. So there is a simplicity that is positive. But what are some other forms of evaluation that could and probably should be used alongside student evaluations of teaching? These would include things like peer review of course material, 
peer review of instruction, review by expert outside evaluators who've been trained to do that, like members of your CTL, teaching scholarship, learning outcome measures, and representative samples in teaching portfolios. Some benefits of peer observation, which is what the rest of this presentation will be about, are that they create an opportunity for reflection, both for the faculty and teaching staff being evaluated and for the certified peer observer, the CPO. They provide data points to balance data yielded from sets. They can be used to document teaching effectiveness. They are formative and designed to provide opportunities and focus on faculty growth over time. And there are trained observers who are focused on analysis of teaching behaviors in a more objective sense. A little bit about our program development and then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Carl. Our CTL has often offered to do peer observations, but we have not had a formalized program in place, either a formalized standardized instrument or a formalized means of training people to become observers so that when we are contacted to do observations, any individual will receive the same experience because we are training the folks who are going out there to doing the observing. Lindsay Linsky and I were at a presentation at the Soto Commons conference I believe last year, it may have been the year before last year, last year was COVID. <laughs> we were at the Soto Commons Conference and we witnessed a presentation by St. Leo University and they had developed a certified peer observer program. And we walked out of there with great interest because there seems to be great faculty interest here in programs like that, but we didn't have anything formalized in place. Carl? You're muted. You'd think, you'd think we would learn that by now, right? So at this point, um, if you're still with us, I'm assuming that you are interested at least in some assessment program of your own. So what I'm gonna do is share an overview of our process and then Roger is going to uh, give you some more details about the results of our process and some decisions we have made. So we started our development process um, and did some literature research at the same time. And it turns out that a lot of what we were doing in our process mirrored what we found in the literature. And so um, I've modeled our process off of what we're doing and what's in the literature. Um, and it's interesting to note that we're talking about developing a peer assessment program for the entire university. Um, but many times in the literature, you'll see that it was, it was a program that was developed for a particular academic unit or department. And so you may have various reasons um, and various places you want to install a peer assessment program. So some generalized things that you need to consider and work through as you're developing a peer assessment program, which um, we're going to call uh, certified peer observation. So we'll use the term CPO quite a bit. Okay, so to begin with, you need to have a reason for creating a program. So that's gonna, that, that reason that purpose is going to guide your other decisions. So that's the first thing you need to decide is why create the program in the first place. And I'm going to outline the um, process. Bear in mind that you can work through different pieces of the process at the same time. It's not a one, do one first, then the other, and then so on. So you're going to need to decide who's involved, um, who's going to do the observations, what faculty are being observed, who's doing the organization. So you need to identify the major players. You also going to have to determine the overall observation process. And this is the biggest piece of the development is, is your observation process and deciding how that's going to go. Um, it's probably not going to be a single observation. You're probably going to have some other meetings and some other things tied into that whole observation process that you need to make decisions about. There are going to be some other logistics you need to consider, um, such as potentially compensating your observers before you get the process and the program underway. Finally, you're going to have to decide how you're going to communicate the results and who's going to get those results. Okay, so why create the program in the first place? You need a purpose and impetus for the program. Now, you may wish to tie your purpose into your um, mission statement or your strategic goals. That's a good idea. Um, you may have more than one purpose. So Becky talked about this with regard to our program. There's this desire for an alternative to uh, student evaluations, and we also wanted this program to provide an opportunity for faculty development and growth in, the, in their teaching. 
part of the decision process or the reason for your program is going to be related to whether you want this to be summative or formative. And potentially you could have both. So for us, we've decided that principally it's formative. That's our main goal. We want it for faculty development. However, there's a secondary goal that the faculty can then use it as a summative report that they can include in their um, annual evaluations and promotion portfolios if they choose to do so. Okay, so who are the players in the game? Who's gonna run the show? Who's in charge of the program? Who's gonna have oversight of the observation process? And for us, everything's coming out of our Center for Teaching, Learning and Leadership. Okay, you're gonna to need to decide who's gonna be doing the observations. For us, initially, we're going to have um, our faculty fellows. We have a few faculty fellows that's gonna run our pilot program and do the observations initially, but that pool of ob observers or CPOs is not gonna be large enough hopefully for our demand later on after we move the scale up of our program. But we haven't made those decisions yet. Okay. You also need to make some decisions about what faculty will be observed. Is it gonna be mandatory for all faculty or certain faculty? Is it gonna be simply voluntary? Um, who's eligible to be evaluated? You need to de determine um, if there's gonna be some sort of selection process. So. Who's gonna do your observations, who's running the show and who's going to be observed. The biggest piece of the puzzle is the observation process itself. So you wanna develop the overall process. How and when will the observer meet with the faculty? Um, what kind of meetings will you have in addition to the actual classroom observation? For us, we're gonna have a pre-meeting where we discuss what's gonna happen in the evaluation and introduce our um, evaluation tool, we'll have an observation, and then we'll have a post meeting where we go over the results with the faculty. Um, and Roger's gonna tell you more about those pieces of our program. You may need to make decisions, back up for a minute, Roger, thank you. Um, you may need to make decisions about uh, multiple observations. Are you gonna have more than one observation? Are you gonna have periodic observations, maybe once a semester, once a year, those kind of decisions about how and when the observations take place you will need some sort of evaluation tool. For us, we started to develop a tool on our own and then we found something called the peer observation evaluation tool in the literature, POET for short. And we haven't made final decisions regarding what our instrument will be, but we anticipate that as we pilot the program and work through our program that we're gonna make modifications as, as we see fit to best fit our needs. Of course, we all know that we don't get it right the first time. And so there can be some learning in the process and there will be some further development. Lastly, though it's not on the slide, you need to uh, decide what's going to happen in the classroom when the CPO is actually performing the observation. Are they going to be filling out some rubric? Are they going to be taking notes? How are they going to keep record of what's going on in the classroom? There may be some other details about how, how you deal with the presence of the observer in the classroom, but you need to make some decisions about the actual observation itself. Okay, now you can move on, Roger. Thank you. Other logistics in the program include um, training of the observers because as Becky addressed with, with sets, you want reliability. Okay, so you're potentially going to, most likely gonna to want to train your observers um, and get some uh, reliability amongst the, the ratings so that you can have some consistency. Okay, you want to consider potentially time commitments. You don't want to overwork your peer observers if you have a small pool of peer observers, you wanna make sure that you respect their time constraints and that you make them aware of their time constraints for the program. You want to inform the faculty who's being observed what kind of time commitment they're gonna involve themselves with. There's other logistics you might need to consider such as um, compensation for your observers. That compensation can be monetary, it can be um, course release, it can be simply uh, uh, fantabulous letter that you write in terms of their service, but you wanna consider at least some sort of compensation for your observers, depending on what kind of observers you use and who you use for your observers. Okay, Roger, we can move to the last step, which is how you will communicate the results. So will you re report your results numerically? Will you provide the results of a, of a rubric? Will you write a written report or a formal letter? Maybe a combination of some of those things but how will you uh, report out the results of the evaluation? 
And then also who's going to see those results? Is it going to be um, just the faculty? Is it going to be the supervisors? Is it going to be um, other individuals across the university? Who's going to have access to those reports? So for us, we're going to have the reports in our center and we're going to make those results available to the faculty in our post meeting and they can have uh, copies of those that they, they can then choose whether or not they want to um, provide those results for other people such as in an annual review or a promotion portfolio. So some things to consider as you're working through your program, um, why are you creating it? Who's gonna be involved? What does the process look like? There's other logistics to consider and how are you gonna report out the results? So Roger is gonna then tell us some of the decisions we made and where we are in our process of developing our program. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about our process and, and some of the reasoning that we have uh, come up with uh, to choose the path that we have chosen. For the factors in our program, we are obviously wanting this to be a faculty development opportunity. We want the faculty to uh, improve their skills overall uh, as a result of this pro pro uh, project. And we also want the, the flexibility to use the reviews to be left to the faculty member. We have not wanted to mandate that this is why you're doing it is, is because you must use this. We're saying, you know, this is an opportunity for you to grow. Um, and, and through this, uh, this is a, as a reflective process, we hope, we hope that you get something more out of it. How you use the results will be up to the faculty member. When we started looking at the recruitment of, of the CPOs, we had a discussion about how, where, where the, where the uh, recruits should come from. We are planning to do a call for participation to see who is interested after our pilot, but we're also going to allow chairs to offer some suggestions about um, people in their faculty that, that, that would be uh, liable candidates for the CPO. They're, both groups are going to complete the application and the CTLL will look at the application and decide if the person um, should, be an, should be a CPO or not. If they are not, um, they're just going to be excluded. However, uh, if they are approved, we're going to let them know of, of the training and uh, of course, make sure that they're going to come and then we're going to start planning our training. The training is going to, to have a branch in it based on whether they are a returning CPO or not. If they were a CPO last year, they kind of get a jump ahead or miss a day, if you will, of class because they'll, they will have already been through this. Uh, the CPO, if they have not been a CPO before or, or people during our pilot, for example, they're all going to, to sit through um, subjects like terminology. Uh, they'll be given an overview of the process, uh, a long discussion about avoiding biases. Uh, then when the groups are together, the, the returning CPOs as well as the new CPOs, we're going to talk about the instrument. We expect this instrument to be an evolving thing, as Carl mentioned. So uh, each year it's going to be necessary for them to sit through and see what changes are, have been made and, and maybe even offer us some, some details about what they would like to see improved. We're going to talk about the pre-meeting processes and what should be done during that process. We're going to, to have some case studies. Uh, Dr. Johnston has been um, looking at or looking for some videos of um, good and bad teaching examples. And, and we're going to be looking at those during, during um, training and talk about, yes, this is, this is, um, this is a viable uh, reason to, to rate this this way or, or this is not, things like that, so that all of our CPOs will be on the same page. Once the, the training is completed, we're simply going to add the CPOs to our list of, of available CPOs, um, and then we'll, we'll be able to draw from that. Another consideration that we had is, uh, how is a CPO request going to be submitted? So if you're, if you're um, a faculty member, how can you get yourself a CPO? Again, we've, we decided two paths. One is going to be a chair is going to request that um, somebody comes in and be observed. Now, this is going to be pretty important. We feel that if the department chair is stepping up and saying, yeah, please go and look at this person as, as a, an organization, the CTLL, we want to get there and make sure that everything is kosher and, and provide any assistance that we can have. Um, and if not, you know, a faculty member can make a request on their own if the chair has not done so. And what, what we're going to do there is probably fall into situations where we may run out eventually of CPOs, hopefully not, but uh, it's a very time consuming process. We're, we're um, estimating anywhere from four to 10 hours per uh, individual before this is done. And that's a lot of commitment. 
Uh, so we're going to check, of course, this, the, the queue of available CPOs. If there is a CPO available, they will be assigned. If not, we'll just keep checking until someone becomes available. Uh, once a CPO is available, we will assign a CPO, let them know, hey, you, you, you have a new, uh, a new client, please go, go and start touching base with them and uh, get on with the observation process. Now, the observation process, we're going to be planning on using Qualtrics to help collect and, and keep track of the data that we have. Most of that is um, to make sure that everybody is, is using the format. All of the data is going to be coming back the same for us, for our own internal assessment, et cetera. But also it gives, a, gives everyone a concrete example of what, 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 what is expected. Uh, I should, uh, as far as the observation process goes, Obviously, the CPO is going to reach out and send the pre-observation form to the client. Uh, the pre-meeting the pre and, and a setting of, up of the observation date will be next. During that pre-meeting, we're going to be asking some questions about, uh, about the lesson that we're about to, to watch, uh, what are the assessments going to look like, and things of that nature. We're going to perform the observation. Uh, we are expecting the uh, CPO to come in and take very copious notes about what has happened. Uh, we've talked about maybe even videotaping if we can. Uh, we're not sure if that's going to work out real well or not because people may not want to be taped or it becomes a distraction for the class. Uh, and then we're going to complete an observation form uh, outside of the, the uh, not during the observation process, but, but after the observation has taken place. Afterwards, we will talk to the faculty member that has been observed. And of course, set up another, uh, or we're going to send the post observation to the faculty member, set up a meeting date to go over that one on one. We want that process to also be reflective. We're going to be asking questions uh, of them about what they thought went well or what could be improved and things like that. And we're planning on repeating this whole process over and over at least one time uh, just to make sure that it wasn't, um, you know, a one off event, whether it was positive or negative but to kind of let them know that we're here for them also as part of this process, uh, we think that's a very important thing. Uh, finally, out, kind of outside of that whole thing, as I mentioned before, we're also going to be looking at the data and analyzing it as for our own internal needs to make sure that what we're doing is appropriate, uh, see if there's opportunities for improvement, et cetera. So we're going to now uh, have another little activity Yes, so I'm gonna pop another link in the chat. So if you could please, it's another Padlet. This one um, <clears throat> requires a bit more uh, self-reflection, but we would like to learn from you and hear, hear your thoughts. So other than, um, other than student evaluations of teaching, what things have helped the most to improve your teaching? And we will watch if you joined late to use the Padlet, there's a little pink uh, plus button at the bottom right hand corner. You can just click on that and, and add to the discussion. Thank you. It's fun to watch these populate. <laughs> <laughs> Having a peer make commentary, like we've been discussing. Co-teaching, I like that idea, or teaching alongside a colleague. Observing your colleagues, that's another excellent one. Sodal resources, very good. What has worked, what has been you know, shown in literature and research to, to work in other classrooms, that's an excellent one. So it's not just for publication purposes, it's for your own benefit too. Yeah, absolutely. Informal student polls, the outside of, outside of sets. Someone mentioned that in the chat as well, giving students an opportunity to 
share their you know concerns or positive what, what's going well what isn't going well in the middle of the semester or at various points just to give them an opportunity to be heard and um and responding to those i've i've found to be very powerful not only in the courses but also in different professional development things i've done you know yes you just a simple google form or you know or scratch paper whatever you have it and giving up students an opportunity to be heard is a good is a valuable one. Depending on the feedback received, I've made mid semester changes based on what they have said, if, if possible, to make it, you know, if I agreed with their assessment and thought that we could improve the course, I, I've done that. Mm -hmm. So it looks as if the um, tiles are slowing down in terms of pop populating. So uh, we can continue our, our discussion now because this is the, the, the definitely this activity was just intended to demonstrate that the focus really is on improving our practice as as educators and improving our improving what what it is that we do in the classroom so that students can continue to learn more and continue to grow and so there's a lot of different ways that 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 can happen and um and so yes thank you for for participating in that and we want to continue learning from you roger if you want to move on to the next slide. I want to continue learning from you and hearing your thoughts on the, on the, the different aspects that we have discussed today. Like, does your institution currently have a peer observation program in place? And if so, would anybody be in, willing to share? Feel free to unmute and, and share with us or feel free to type in the chat, whatever you're comfortable with. I will. They don't formally have a formal program. Mm -hmm. I will jump in and say that, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we've been asked multiple times to conduct evaluations. And when I've gone out and done that, I have gone out and observed and took copious notes and then wrote a letter on behalf of the individual that I was observing, but we did not have a formalized process. And I felt confident in going out and conducting observations that way because my background is education and music education and my job for over a decade was evaluating pre-service teachers. So I felt confident going out and simply observing, taking notes and writing a letter, but someone who had not been through training and observation of teachers might not feel as comfortable or be as competent in that kind of a scenario. And that's where having a formalized program with a standardized instrument and training for the observers, I think comes into play. There are some in, uh, great responses in the chat. Uh, uh, Candace shares that, the um, peer evaluation at her institution is informal, but faculty are encouraged to visit others' classroom classes and evaluators have some forms to check box. So I, I, I guess if, if you do visit another class, it, you know, it is in, documented. Um, so yes, peer op observing others is valuable, not only for the person being observed, but for the person observing, absolutely. It's that we can learn so much from each other. There are examples in the literature of departments um, formalizing programs of this evaluation rather than just letting it happen organically or however else it may occur. Mm -hmm. So in some, it is required in some institutions, according to the chat. And yes, quality matters for online courses, absolutely. So Lindsay, a while back in the chat, somebody had asked something to the effect of, do you have any data regarding the use of sets and uh, not sets of um, peer observations in a summative sense? 
Um, I don't, what I do have is um, data suggesting that completely objective controlled studies find low correlation between sets data and objective measures of teaching effectiveness like course grades, retention, drop add, those sorts of things. Um, and that uh, peer, you know, we're, I wanna make sure that we make clear that we're not making the argument that a certified peer observation should serve as the sole measure of a summative high stakes evaluation at all. We are saying that certified peer observations can get closer to an objective measure of teaching effectiveness and should be used alongside other forms of data when evaluating a faculty member in a global sense. Absolutely, yes, thanks for sharing. Multiple, multiple sources of information really are what is the, is a key and with an observation being one of them. So Lindsay, I'd kind of like to ask everybody, mm -hmm. um, feel free to put it in the chat. If you do not have a formalized peer observation program, either a formalized instrument, a formalized means of training observers or any sort of a formal program in place, do you feel like this is something that you could do at the departmental level as opposed to from the institutional level? You know, what are your thoughts about starting something more formalized within a department? And Roger, I believe that is the second bullet. So if you Actually, want to... that's the third one. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. We'll come back to the second then. Here we go. Well, I was just going to jump in um, orally because it's a little faster than typing. Um, I actually am here because I had been talking to some of my colleagues. We have a bunch of new hires in our department who were hired last year. And uh, one of them in particular had been at Agnes Scott and said that each semester that she was there, they always had two peer observations um, for everybody there. And I was like, oh, yeah, we should definitely be doing that. <laughs> so we had been talking, a group of us in our department, about doing something like this. Um, but since it sounds like if this is something that can run through our like SALT office, it almost makes me want to reach out to them and have them be in charge of thinking through some of the logistics of this. So thank you. Yes, I believe uh, different universities handle it in different ways. And some it is at the, at the um, individual departmental level. So it doesn't have to be a whole institution thing if you wanted to start in your, in your department as well. Just an interesting comment in the discussion um, about starting a faculty learning community around development of such a process, which I think is a great idea. Mm -hmm. In fact, to piggyback on that, Carl, that, that was one of the things that helped to spur this project of ours on is faculty expressing a desire for, uh, for a program such as this. So also one of the participants asked about the poet and I attached the link into the chat box. Um, not to scroll up a little bit now, but uh, that is a link to an article that has the poet a tool instrument attached at the end. So, uh, so I believe we are on the third question, correct? So what are some barriers and, and or solutions to developing a process such as this? Workload, yes, <laughs> that's for sure. Right, one of the things we're gonna have to be cognizant of since we're having separate observers um, and not, you know, faculty members evaluating one another, um, we can't, we, we got to be cognizant of not burning them out. Mm -hmm. that, that's very true, Carl, because if they do too many observations, the quality of those 
could diminish. And if, and then the same if they don't do enough, you know, if they have huge gaps of time between the observations, they could forget some of their training. So, so yes, there is there is a fine line there. Yeah, and Anne, you're you're right. Um, if it's voluntary basis, the ones who need it most probably aren't going to volunteer. Um, so we tried to address that to some degree, allowing department chairs to say, hey, we want you to evaluate this person or assess this person's performance in the classroom. But we wanted to keep also the um, focus squarely on growth. And so that's yes. why one, as Roger described, the, a huge part of the, of the initial initial program is just the peer observer getting to know the faculty and having that pre-discussion basically emphasizing you know that I'm here to help you and what you know what do you want me to look for and whatever other questions and so that so that it's not a gotcha and it's more of a more of a positive experience for both both people involved and and the focus stays on growth. Mm -hmm. And yes, that is a barrier um, and brings up that how the good teachers are probably the ones more likely to be involved. Those who could most benefit from observations may be less likely to volunteer. Yeah. And um, so, we, and that would be true, um, especially in the beginning. Our hope is that as more and more people go through this process and can, you know, word of mouth spreads in terms of the benefits and how it wasn't a threatening, you know, gotcha type of experience. Our hope is that more and more people will participate in it. Yeah, someone a minute ago back in the chat had mentioned that if you're not accustomed to having people in your classroom, it can be intimidating. Mm -hmm. And you are right, it absolutely can. Um, we really hope that through the training that we put the CPO observers through and the pre-meetings in which we go through the instruments and all of the terminology with the person who will be observed and really talk about the process and how this is 100% intended to be a mutually supportive, beneficial growth process not a gotcha moment or an opportunity to you know give you a single negative evaluation at a single point in time that even if there are some things that are identified as things that could or perhaps should improve the whole point of this is to provide another you know let some time go by provide the person feedback let some time go by and then do another observation looking to document change or growth over time and by doing that and focusing on the growth over time it removes some of the threat because it's not a single single absolute summation of teaching it's just a point in time Absolutely. And I, I'd like to highlight uh, Mary Harriet Talbot's comment uh, that your CTL has created a SCOT program where students, it stands for students collaborating on teaching, and the students are trained on how to evaluate faculty teaching, and they go in and observe um, a, an instructor. And it's, and it's not widely publicized. It's kept between our office and the instructor, not anyone else, unless the faculty wants to share it. So that's that's really that's a really interesting model, Mary. Would you like to unmute and describe? Tell us more about that. Um, yeah. Sure, I'm kind of multitasking here. I'm sorry. Um, it, this is a program that um, a previous associate provost had brought um, to our office, and. Um, it, we've had really some good success with it. My favorite was the faculty forgot that he'd had it set up. And because it was a larger class, my student workers went in and he didn't even realize it. Huh. He'd forgotten it was happening. And so it was a really honest thing. And then what we do is the students sit down because they kind of look at here's the time. This is what happened. Here's another time. Um, then we, uh, the other instructional designer and I go together and um, look at what their observations are and then we they write up a report that is not judgmental it's just observational mm -hmm. about this is what you did and this is how it worked what we saw happening and who was bored who was not bored what happened you know they little small things they may not have noticed but it was a really for everybody who's did it they really appreciated it and if they want to they can take it and make it part of their pnt um, in that they are working on their teaching, but they don't have to. It's just kept between our office 
and that faculty member who did it. So um, we just had them work through, you know, this is how you observe a teacher and how you look and see if they're teaching, which is the real thing. We're not looking at what they're wearing. We're not looking at all of those other, are they the devil or not? <laughs> so that's what we did. Thank you so much for sharing. I could see that being very valuable information to the to the instructors, as well as such amazing experience to the students for the students as well, and um, great great experience for them. That's the um, our website that kind of goes over it too. If you're interested, feel free to contact me. Thank you, Mary. That's great. Yes, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. That's one of the great things about these webinars is, you know, everybody learns from everybody. It's such, such great input. Thank you. We also have a variety of resources. Um, I know Denise uh, has been very diligent about posting things. Uh, as they come up, but uh, the reference list that uh, we've used will be uh, part of that document. So if you see something there of interest to you, uh, great. Otherwise, uh, thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you so much to all four of you for presenting. This is this is great. I student uh, our typical student evaluations uh, system is so problematic and I love that you all have tackled a way to try and get more authentic evaluations for faculty. Um, in the chat here I'm just going to put the oops uh, put the link to our website which you guys have all seen at this point because this is how you registered but um, we have one webinar left in the summer series and it is how to help students write a resume. I think this is very cool. It's um, how to help students see how to transfer the learning that they have done in the classroom into skills for their careers. And um, that is on August 4th at 11 a.m. You can register for it on our website, which is also where you will find a link to this webinar and the materials within 24 hours. Um, so you can come back and um, get those materials then. So thank you again to our presenters. You all were great. Thanks to all of you who participated because it's pretty lame to have a webinar with one <laughs> participating and you guys, you guys showed up. So thank you so much. And we will see you next time.